the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies, uh, especially, and whether there was um, whether the event depiction this diagram actually happened, which is to say the a flyby of the galaxies past each other. Um, now, um, first of all, the energy budget of the universe um, is supposed to look like this, with the baryons that we're all familiar with, the protons and neutrons, um, making up only 5%. So I'll explain the dark matter and the <coughs> dark energy are quickly. Um, so uh, the uh, one piece of evidence for the dark matter that's quite compelling is the bullet cluster. So essentially, this shows that the mass of the uh, wait, it's, a, it's colliding. It's two colliding galaxy clusters, and the gas is concentrated here and here, uh, but the mass distribution is concentrated mostly there. And you can infer that based on how um, images of background galaxies are distorted. Um, so this is going to be very difficult to explain uh, with any um, theory that doesn't have matter here. And um, because the, the gas isn't there, then probably <coughs> what is there is dark matter. Um, so it does look like you need dark matter. However, the important thing to realize is the Milky Way would be very small at this scale. It wouldn't really be visible at all. So although the universe does look like it has dark matter, it's not obvious that it is capable of clustering at small scales. Um, so um, also, the um, speed of the uh, galaxy clusters that are colliding here uh, is very high. It's about 3,100 kilometers per second. And in the standard model, uh, that is very unlikely. So this is a probability distribution for the speeds uh, of at which two galaxy clusters collide. Um, with, with modified neutrino dynamics, the uh, gravity is stronger at long range. And that increases the impact speed that makes it, means that you you get fewer impacts at low speed and more at higher speed. And that makes it much more plausible. So it looks like some kind of long range modification to gravity is going on. Um, What's the axis? Probability distribution. Uh, it's a fraction of uh, ga galaxies which collide at uh, some speed or less. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, for example, like, a, yeah, like with a standard model, the probability of the speed which is higher than this is very small. Um, so, um, that, so uh, what uh, people studying this have said uh, is that this is unlikely in the standard model. Basically, the probability is about 10 to the minus 9. Um, now, a uh, lower velocity would also be rare, actually. But it doesn't matter because a lower velocity would not reproduce the the photograph. Essentially, like in order to get the uh, gas to be separated by such a large amount, they they need to. Oh yeah, uh, to be separated this amount for the dark matter to be separated by a larger amount, they need to meet a certain amount of gas drag, and that requires a certain speed because obviously there's less drag at lower speed. So if you try and reduce the impact speed too much, then the dark matter and the gas will just end up in the same place. Um, so that can't be right. Um, so essentially, um, yeah, you, you can't explain this within the standard model very easily. Um, so, uh, but we don't have too many observations like this because galaxy clusters are not that, there aren't that many of them and the chances of them colliding are relatively small. So, we need other sorts of observations to try and understand what is going on. Um, so before we um, do that, first of all, uh, the important thing to realize is that galaxy clusters seem to need dark matter, uh, but they also seem to need stronger gravity. Um, seems like that. But the dark matter might be a very light particle. Uh, in that case, yeah, it will fit the CMB data, and it will cluster galaxy it won't cluster uh, in individual galaxies, but in galaxy clusters, it will be able to cluster that like scale. It's simply like the uh, question of like what the typical length scale that you can travel is, because it's quite low mass. It, it moves very fast, and it's unable to cluster at galaxy scales. Um, so that's possible, and, uh, and if that was true, then galaxies wouldn't have dark matter. But you'd be consistent with all the evidence I've shown so far. So I guess what we have to do then is to look at galaxies to try and find out what, 
were that such small scales. And ultimately, you're not able to resolve whether dark matter exists at small scales by looking at large scales. You have to look at small scales. So I'm going to show data from galaxies now. Um, but do bear in mind that the gravity might possibly not have been Newtonian. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, before we do that, just a quick uh, recap about dark energy. So, um, essentially what's shown here is the, um, how much the universe has expanded since the supernova was observed. And uh, up here is the <coughs> distance to the supernova, so uh, relative to a particular model. So, uh, the, these models don't have any, they, they just have matter in the universe. Like, this has a small amount of ma matter, and this has like even less, and this has like no matter at all. But that still didn't match the data. What actually needs to happen is the need to be much further away. And that, that means, given the finite speed of light, the, uh, the, for the same change in the size of the universe, the, the universe must have just taken much longer than in this model. The reason why it actually did that is presumably because in this model, the expansion rate is constant with time. So actually, the expansion rate must be even smaller in the past than it is today. Um, and this is what is called dark energy, supposedly, is responsible for the accelerating the expansion rate of the universe. Um, so we'll uh, come to how this is interpreted later on. Um, for now, um, uh, yeah, so I have to explain the dark matter and the dark energy. The dark energy actually dominates the universe, but it's unable to cluster, we think. Um, so, um, galaxies. Well, these also show a, a discrepancy in the acceleration. Um, so the, this is a rotation curve, uh, and the, well, this is the rotation curve that actually happens. But in Newtonian gravity, you'd get this to happen if, with the visible mass. So perhaps the discrepancy is caused by dark matter. Um, so um, that means that the galaxy would look like this with a halo of dark matter. Uh, but do remember that that is only a possibility. We don't actually have any direct evidence for a galaxy. Although this artist has drawn in a halo of dark matter in blue, actually the galaxy looks like this, and there might be invisible dark matter here, but there might not. Um, so um, when, when I'm showing now the uh, acceleration discrepancy um, as a function of the acceleration. Um, so a ratio of one would mean there was no discrepancy. So the system is uh, up here somewhere, uh, and the ratio is one, so that's good. But that's how neutral gravity was derived uh, in, uh, greatly in the solar system. Um, so that's, that, by definition, must be. Uh, the important thing is here, it started to deviate. Now, if you invent dark matter, then anything about one is possible in principle, because you just have sort of a, like a galaxy. Um, and if you... Because of the shell theorem, you'll need to consider the dark matter at like interior radii. So how much dark matter there is in here will raise the force towards the center. And um, but but any amount of dark matter in here is possible. So how much these days are taken? So it's like this. Um, you compare the rotation curve uh, with the prediction from neutral gravity. Um, so and each point is a each is the same total of the power rotation curve. Uh, each point is. So there, there'll be multi, you get much more than one data point from a single galaxy. You get about 10 data points per galaxy, usually. No, 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 no. You have a galaxy and you measure the rotation curve. Yeah. Now, uh, how, how from the rotation curve you go to, to the points in that graph? Uh, so you need to work out, how, ah, so you need to use V squared by R to work out the acceleration. And, and, that's, and that's the axis. Uh, and uh, then you divide by the, yeah, that, that, that's, so, sorry, the x-axis actually, yeah, it's essentially that. Um, the and how you get to the y? To the the y-axis is the ratio between the true acceleration and the prediction. The prediction is obtained using Newtonian gravity, so basically... With which mass? Hmm, with the visible mass. So, so, presume, so what you do roughly is you work out the mass of interior radii, and g f will equal basically and then, and what g actually is, you, you have to measure, like the actual acceleration, and then you divide g by g and plot that up there. The fact is that they haven't agreed, which is why the ratio is not equal to one, but, but, um, 
but that's what's thought of that. So there's some serious discrepancy with neutron gravity, uh, unless you invent the dark matter. Uh, yeah, but okay. You say the Newtonian prediction is taken using the visible mass. Yes. But you don't see mass; you see light. There are so yes. You, you there, need, there, you there need some something to to. You need some assumptions about the, the mass to light ratio of the galaxies, um, which generally is done by looking in the local solar neighborhood where you can't see all the stars. And, and how strong is this exists. prediction with respect to the assumption you're making? Um, so, uh, so the mass to light ratio is typically vary by a factor of two or, or so, approximately. Um, so you could argue these points are actually a little bit less. The problem with this is that you wouldn't, is that you would you could fail to fit the inner part of the rotation curve. So with Newtonian gravity, you try and fit as much of the rotation curve as you can, so to speak. Um, you try and minimize the discrepancy. Uh, and then you're still left with the discrepancy at large right here because it always flat lines, whereas it doesn't do Newtonian gravity. So uh, they're, they're, it, they're just sensitive to some extent to some of these assumptions a little bit. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, what, uh, yeah. So what's happened here, um, so I guess what I was arguing is that the dark matter, although it can actually explain the discrepancy of course, um, is that it's not necessarily the best hypothesis because you could get data points anywhere in this region above one um, in principle. And because you haven't actually got that, because you've got a tight correlation, Perhaps you're better off saying that neutron gravity needs to simply be boosted by some factor depending on the acceleration. This will have much fewer as a, much fewer sort of free parameters in it than inventing a separate distribution of dark matter for every galaxy. Um, but I haven't explained why gravity might be modified yet. Um, so um, we'll have a look at neutron gravity in a sec now. Basically, it doesn't always work. Uh, what the example I've given here is uh, that if you e equate the Newtonian gravitational force with the circular rotation speed, like the centripetal force, then you get like the rotation speed. And if that, so that's a good prediction. And it should work, but if the velocity is close to the speed of light, you know that you probably get the numbers wrong. So you want to use general relativity in that case. Um, so we used to circumstances where Newtonian gravity doesn't work. Um, now, that's because of relativity. What about with quantum mechanics? Then, mechanics, then that actually affect um, gravity uh, in, in certain circumstances. Well, what's uh, important to realize with quantum mechanics is that you can't attain arbitrarily high accuracy in position velocity measurements. So you can't attain arbitrarily high acceleration measurements. Um, now, um, Classical theories, of course, like ignore such facts because they assume you can do things exactly. Um, now, let's suppose there was a region of space time which was like curved because of some matter here. It, was, it, was, it looked like that. So classically, you treat it like this because, of course, you know all the fluctuations. Um, but um, here, the mass, for example, is much less. The acceleration is much less. Consequently, um, it's only a little bit curved. Of course, they're drawing the fluctuations as well because they must be. So, what do these lines actually represent? Like, this is representing how it is to be designed to give an how space time like, looks, roughly speaking. Like, what does that mean? It, it's just a schematic idea. It is to show, like, normally we have this picture of space time being curved due to the presence of matter. Yeah. So, this is what I was trying to show. The classical theory does that. But in reality, it must have looked like this because there must have been some sort of fluctuations going on. Uh, unless you don't be in quantum mechanics. Um, so here, like, it's the same, except that the acceleration is much smaller. Um, but that's the only difference between these diagrams. And here, again, it's much the same, like the classic theory, but the acceleration is smaller. The problem is here, uh, you could approximate this like this and say that was more or less a good model. Whereas here, if you try to approximate this like this, then, you know, depending on very certain things like you might possibly have gotten the numbers wrong because this wasn't so on average this looks the, like the same but for example if there was a lot of energy carried in these fluctuations and, the, the, and they're absent here so there might have been some trouble with the classical theory uh, at very very small curvature 
Um, so we'll try to get a rough idea of when the classical theory might actually get into trouble because of the quantum fluctuations which it ignores. Um, now, basically what I'm suggesting is that space-time will look smooth um, if you appear to, without worrying about accuracy too much. But if you want to say, ah, oh, the accuracy of this object is 10 to minus 10, then you must really look, then you must have been making assumptions about space-time being very, very like smooth and possible to measure things that accurately. And, um, well, that means you have to be look at a sort of or sort of schematic is that you look at it sort of closer and closer. Well, and eventually you start to see the quantum nature of space time. So we, roughly speak. So um, that, that must, that is likely to happen at some scale, which we don't know where it is, or what, is, what it actually looks like. But um, if there was, if the curvature, um, yeah, another thing to realize is that the, the curvature here probably carries energy. Um, because the curvature is sort of, you don't know exactly how much it is and it's, it oscillates in certain ways. So it's quite likely, I think, that the space-time will carry a certain mini, small amount of energy. Um, now, if you actually look at the universe on large scales, it, it, it is accelerating apart. And um, it's, well, most people, I think, would agree that this is some sort of vacuum energy which was associated with every bit of space-time, essentially. Um, so, um, I don't know if that's right, but uh, for the moment we can, as I'm assuming it is, in that case, what you can do is you can use the energy density in the vacuum, which we have a measurement of under this assumption, and compare it with the energy density in a gravitational field, which is given by this equation. So this is the energy density now classical gravitational field, a uh, generative won't matter for weak fields uh, in any case. So this is a neutral gravity result, so you know the centuries. This uh, you estimate from the dark energy measurements. Um, if you then do this, then this is outcome. So you basically, you expect modifications to gravity due to quantum effects might possibly arise at an acceleration of uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters per second squared and less. Um, so, this is what this is possible. Um, at least, like I don't think you could like promise me that gravity would be work classically at accelerations below this, whereas at accelerations above this, it, it would be unlikely for gravity to deviate from classical theory. Um, so it's the only thing is possible for deviations to come in below this, but not really much above it. Um, so um, what actually happens with these low accelerations? Well, basically, um, classical theories shouldn't work very well anymore because really you want to be using a quantum gravity theory, which doesn't even exist yet. So we won't know what's going on. But um, at even smaller accelerations where um, you have even less energy density compared to the vacuum in the gravitational field, like it seems like the discrepancy with the classical theory will be even larger. So uh, if you see in the data some kind of um, this uh, discrepancy with neutral gravity that depends on the acceleration and doesn't depend on anything else seemingly, then it may be a signature of quantum effects. The reason is it's basically the energy density is controlling the um, deviation in this case, if that was observed. Um, so I'll just show the observations again quickly. Um, this is where I was suggesting gravity should be modified at accelerations below that um, be because of quantum effects. So remember, 10 to minus 10 meters per second squared is a very small number. You'd be hard pressed to actually construct an experiment which could measure such a small acceleration. Um, and it may not even be fundamentally possible. But we don't know yet if that is possible. Um, so um, it does appear that the ac acceleration is actually the only relevant parameter because obviously the galaxies are all different. There's all sorts of other parameters which uh, might affect them, but they don't seem to matter. So we'll come to that in a sec. But um, it does look like there is some kind of quantum effect going on. And of course, like uh, in everyday circumstances, we're used to like the failure of classical theories at very low energies, any kind of condensed matter physics, for example. So um, it's possible this is what was going on. So how actually is this supposed to work um, if you believe that it was actually a failure of the classical gravity? Because we can't just write down the quantum gravity equations now. So what you have to do is you have to say 
that neutrino dynamics is off by some factor depending on the acceleration, which is empirical. And that means that we don't have a fundamental basis for this. Uh, however, you need the flexibility in your theory. There's no point writing down some equations and saying you know what's going on because you don't. So we have to have flexibility there. Um, but basically, obviously, it has to give more gravity to the same mass. And that way, it may be able to resolve the problem uh, of the acceleration discrepancy. Um, so uh, the basic equation looks like this, uh, that g times some mu function is equal to gn. gn is a prediction of neutron gravity for the system. Um, so for spherical symmetry, you, it looks like this. Now, the, there is no modification if the mu function is equal to 1, which is correct when when the r cubed is much greater than 1. In other words, when the field is much stronger than a0, you're, you're down here somewhere, and there's no modification. But at very low acceleration, the trick is to set mu of x equals x. And that means g will equal the square root of gn times a0, because the function will be equal to its argument. Um, and of course, if you take the square root of the Newtonian force, you get, you get this, uh, because you get the 1 of r times the 1 over r squared, and <coughs> the gm will become square root of gm. So, um, that's interesting. Is that at all, like, reasonable? Um, well, they, first of all, um, the 1 over r uh, term is interesting because it means that if you then try to plot a rotation curve, you need to equate g with v squared by r. So v will be dependent of r, and the rotation curve will flat line. So that is correct in most galaxies. More importantly, the rotation curve will flat line at this value, which is square root of this. So obviously, that is a strong prediction. Now, this actually does work in, in a wide range of galaxies. So what's shown here is the speed of uh, rotation uh, per second, uh, at the flat line level. Uh, and um, up here is the baryonic mass of the galaxy. So this theory obviously assumes that's all there is. Um, and uh, it's worked over a factor of a million almost in mass. Uh, star dominated galaxies are dark blue and gas dominated ones are light blue. So these kinds of things have not had much effect. Um, what, what is also important to realize is that the, to fit this graph, we need to assume that A0 is this much. But I was saying how quantum gravity effects should matter at about 9 times 10 to minus 10. So it's the right order of magnitude. Um, the, the modification is uh, A0 essentially is basically where gravity is, um, I think, 50% stronger than Newtonian gravity. So it, it's about the right sort of acceleration scale, roughly. So at what value of R did the correction start to kick in? What value of R? There was value of it was it was there's no there's no particular value of R, it's just there's no particular value of R. It's just the value of G in Newton compared to A. Yeah. So if you wanted to know like why exactly um, it uh, why exactly you should use the Monder result, basically it's in these circumstances. But this will depend on the mass of the galaxy, so it's not a particular radius. Yeah. But if you look at a particular axis, you could use that. Um, but um, so I'll show a more exact equation if you want in a sec. Um, but um, yeah, so th this is quite interesting. What does the Tally Fisher relation actually mean in the standard model, where, where that must be dark matter explaining everything somehow? So classically, the if galaxies had seven had one sixth of their mass being baryons and the rest being dark matter, uh, and the dark matter is distributed in the way that models show they should be, then the rotation curve is sort of flat line, and um, you but the problem is you end up along the dash curve, which is not good. Um, so somehow the the voids must be transferred down there, which is assumed, uh, which is done presumably by losing baryons from the galaxy, uh, but that won't affect the rotation curve because they don't make up most of the mass. So it is possible to lose baryons from a galaxy. You can have supernovae drive gas out. Uh, this is not totally impossible. Uh, the problem comes when you realize that these are random processes and they shouldn't have led to tight corrections of this nature. Um, 
So, um, basically, you can lose variance, as I'm saying, but uh, in a small galaxy, you only need, for example, a small number of supernovae, and the process is going to be a little bit stochastic, uh, depending on where exactly they were, and exactly how many stars formed, things like that. Also, if you accrete a lot of gas in environment, that would push you like up, which would be perfectly possible. So, um, basically, a tight correlation of the, how much you drop from this curve down, from this line down, is basically unlikely. Um, in fact, like, if you ask people honestly what would happen, and they didn't have seen the data, then they'd probably say that the points could move both below and above, and basically a, a thick region around here would be filled up by the galaxies, which hasn't happened. Um, so there is something a bit unusual here. Um, what about the size of the galaxy? Well, um, basically for the same mass of galaxy, obviously they have, it's not obvious, but they, but they do have a wide range of sizes. And uh, that obviously doesn't affect at all how many variants you lose from the galaxy. Well, that doesn't make much sense because it should be really. Um, the, a larger galaxy, for example, will have much less density of gas. And it might, for example, form fewer stars, or it might be easy to drive gas out, or it might be any number of other things. So size is obviously quite important, right? Especially if a galaxy is 10 times bigger, and therefore has 100 times more area, but the same mass. So um, that is, yeah? So what's VF mean? Uh, yeah, VF is the velocity at the flat line level. Because it's tightly... So what's the flat line level? So, so basically what's done here is that you... Um, Actually, the time issue relation is a relation between the mass of a galaxy and like a certain property of its rotation curve. Uh, so, so, so this is the uh, um, the, the reason. So really, you should plot mass here, but because it's so tightly correlated, it won't make any difference. Um, the important thing is that the galaxy of the same mass has a wide range of sizes. Which actually not so unreasonable. Um, How do you know that's the rotation curve that's like this? Um, is this from Mont or is it from? Zero? No, no. But it's a rotation curve is a measurement. Yeah. Um, why, why does the velocity tend towards a constant at nine radius? It's your point. I don't know yet. It's your point to either introduce that matter or. I mean, you, you, look at, you look at galaxies and galaxies behave like this. Mm. Yeah, I, you, I, you, I, do the me, you do the measurement, those measurements are done by uh, like radial velocity, top, yeah, yeah, the radial yeah. Doppler shift radial velocity, like using yeah. H, H2 lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and you, you took the data and the data appears to lie on yeah, something. Exactly. I'm just drawing a typical rotation curve. Um, I, all, everything doesn't fit into your equations. Um, so, um, yeah, I must say something here on the dark matter side, which is that um, the problem on this on, on this rotation curve is that they are not, you, we don't have data far enough. Yeah, yeah. To see yeah, the I, 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 think I mean, there may be, if, if there's dark matter and the halo ends at some point, like, yeah. like, so, so like, like, like it does, we should, yeah, yeah. I mean, there principle. would be a Keplerian. In principle, uh, yeah. In principle, if the dark matter halo ended here, you may be able to get like the rotation curve to fall yeah, The problem is that we don't have data so far. Well, I, at least you say it. Because stuff. Yeah, fair enough. We, we don't have data that far out. Yeah. Oh, I'm trying to do the dark matter. Because the stuff that can be light ends at some point. Yeah. yeah. So according to Mons, the radius at which the velocity passes out is when R is bigger than the square root of the Yeah, yeah approximately that. Um, roughly. If you're doing Newtonian dynamics, it's where the halo is. In Newtonian dynamics, we determine the properties of the halo and the disk. Okay. Yes, um, when the halo starts to dominate. Basically, yeah. Um, so, but, but, yeah, both explanations seem valid at this point, I think. Um, but the one was working with, yeah, and true, your rotation curve is set, so you have a better idea of what was going on. Um, but, yeah, um, the important thing is the size has actually not affected the amount of feedback. Uh, if you actually look at how feedback happens in terms of a simulation, you'll see that it's extremely complicated. And therefore, it's very random, like exactly how much happens. Simulation is always with a large scattering, how much gas you actually lost from a galaxy. Even with very, very simulation conditions. It depends on so many complicated things. So obviously, like, the, this kind of tight correlation is a bit unusual. 
Um, but um, what about the rest of the rotation curve? I know you <coughs> talked about the flat time level so far, <coughs> why that's known well. So some, if the rotation was only measured up to here, for example, then we simply would block that. Um, so um, this is one example rotation curve. There's 19 more looking like this, but this is one of them. And yeah, the uh, Newtonian prediction has gone like that. So there was a drop in the density of material around here. Um, Oh, sorry, a rise in density material here, so I think. Um, and uh, with, with dark matter, you because the dark matter is like not able to radiate to clump into structures like the gas, it will form a smooth ha spherical halo around the galaxy, and therefore you get a really smooth rotation curve, so you get a smooth blue curve. So remember, we've adjusted all sorts of parameters of the halo in order to get this fit, which have not at all come from first principles at all, but this is still not very good fit to the data uh, compared to the Mon prediction, which had no free parameters. So this equation has been used, uh, was written down in 1984, and it still seems to work very well. Um, we, the, they, you need a particular value phase here, and the mu function has a little bit of an impact, but not very much, because as you can probably see, like the, the discrepancy is so large that you're at x much less than one. And therefore, like you all, mu of x must equal x, whatever you believe. So, so um, the, it's not very sensitive these kinds of predictions. Um, more importantly, the dip here could not be explained with dark matter. And so, so the purple is the prediction from mom. Yeah. But why, why is it not smooth? Like because like it, it the ah so mom basically involves multiplying neutron gravity by some factor. So neutron gravity says there should be a dip in the rotation curve. And Mon will also say there should be a dip in the rotation curve, it should just be much higher. So, up. so you're using the mass distribution that you measure yeah. when you're feeding it into this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Mon, so there's if, only this. If the mass distribution has a dip, so if the, basically, yeah, if the mass distribution has a dip, then Mon's rotation curve will have a dip because it uses the mass. Whereas the dark matter, you couldn't do that. Sorry, how about the mass to light conversion? Yes, so. This is a huge problem in all this reason. Um, so it's. You can. So you have to adjust the mass line ratio a little bit in any model to try and get it to work. Um, I think what people do is, I can't remember exactly how they do it, but one thing you can do is observe stars like near the sun and get a good idea of the, well you can observe all the stars pretty much in the local solar neighborhood, like, and even down to very faint ones, and then get an idea of how much mass is there and how much light is being emitted by this region. And for a different stellar population, the different um, color, you could um, gauge that it was for, for example, if the stars were much redder, then they'd be much fainter, and they must have a, a higher mass to light ratio. So you can uh, color correct what people see near the sun. And there's very sort of characters that we put in. There's still a little bit of uncertainty surrounding this. Um, but um, generally for a particular galaxy, a particular it should have the same mass to light ratio if it's not the same color. And uh, if it doesn't, then it's usually clear how to correct for color dip gradients. So you, usually it's possible to do this reasonably well. Um, also remember, we're talking about huge acceleration discrepancies, which I'm not going to explain with uh, simply having more um, mass. So th that has been known for 30 years now, that you cannot get the rotation curves matched with neutronium gravity plus a reasonable mass to light ratio. Yeah. I still don't understand why the dark matter curve has to be so smooth. Because the, the visible mass has got dips. Yeah, but the dark matter The dark is, matter is smooth. But the dark so matter then the total mass has dips due to yes. the dips in the visible mass. But, the, but you are adding the dark matter and the visible mass in quadrature, and the dark matter is dominating this galaxy. So although there should have been a dip there, it wouldn't really show up. So as dips just, just small. They're, 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 they're reduced. Small. They're reduced by the dark matter, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because, because the dark matter is actually, I, actually the galaxy is generally even is assumed that the dark matter is providing all the gravity. That's not a bad assumption usually. In this galaxy in particular is a very good one. Um, so the, there's a, a, another 90 or so rotation curves which also well fit by Mon. They, they look, most of them will look a bit different. They, they look more like this actually, rather than like that. But otherwise they, I mean things they work well. Um, there's also a few that don't, various reasons, um, all, mainly because all galaxies aren't perfect rotating disks. Um, 
like even like spiral galaxies or something, they can uh, be disturbed, as they're called. Um, so, um, uh, right, now we look at how these galaxies actually got there. So, um, with the standard model, uh, with the dark matter, supposedly the Milky Way looks like this. Which is interesting. Um, so the Milky Way is basically with discus fit in there. It's got a huge dark matter surrounding it. Presumably that is what is explaining the Milky Way's rotation curve, which is also known not to work with neutral gravity, plus physical matter only. Um, the problem with this picture is like, why have all these like, structures actually gone? Because this is what the, it actually looks like. Um, so what's happened, um, basically some of these very faint galaxies correspond to some of the small dark matter halos in this simulation. So the huge dark matter halos, well, they've just vanished. So that's not good. What's actually happened most likely is the Milky Way. So the existence of material in the universe is obviously not in dispute. What must have happened, the Milky Way must have accreted of everything there and left the surroundings nearly empty. Well, it is basically empty compared to this picture. And that probably requires you to have stronger gravity than in this model. Or you could have much less matter than in this model, but in order to form a structure like the Milky Way in the center, the, that matter must cluster much more efficiently. So um, with, with modified neutral dynamics, you do both at the same time, essentially. You have only, yeah. Um, but something along those lines seems to be required by the structure formation. The structure formation does not, miss, does not seem to work well in the standard model. Uh, so you can argue that this might have been about right. But, um, more, so there's some more serious problems with the satellite galaxies, actually, which I'll try to explain now. First of all, the Milky Way is a, a disk um, oriented this way, the, and the satellite galaxies are distributed like in a sort of vertical planar structure, which is a bit bizarre. Um, now, um, the yeah, so this is a real photograph of another galaxy, um, and what's happened is a galaxy is, I think it's come in like this. Then ended up here. So another galaxy has actually interacted with this one and left material on a polar orbit. So that is obviously possible for this to happen. Um, now, um, what I think happened is the same thing happened to the Milky Way uh, is that another heavy galaxy flew past, flung out a huge amount of material, which then coalesced into galaxies that orbit here and around here, presumably. So we'll look though at a simulation which shows this is possible. Basically a galaxy is flown past at an 85 degree angle and it's led to the disk of the galaxy being thickened, but more importantly it's led to a huge amount of material orbiting in a polar orbit, which might later coalesce into a galaxy if the simulation had been run like that with dissipation basically. Um, now, is there any way to explain the data without like a flyby of another galaxy? Um, the, um, so basically, the uh, anisotropy is uh, characterized by how like the angle spread is on the uh, relative to the Milky Way center. It's like basically less than thirty degrees, so about thirty degrees. So you want your simulation to get like probability distribution like at, at angles of even smaller than thirty degrees and you measure how much probability there actually is there. So the gray line is for an isotropic distribution. Naturally, without a flyby, uh, as you saw, the simulation did look pretty isotropic. So obviously, this uh, outcome of the simulation is going to be more or less isotropic. So that's what's happened in these three, even just standard model simulations. These three are also standard model simulations, and these are also standard model. None of them actually match the observations very well. Um, this involved a flyby of a heavy galaxy with the same mass. That worked pretty well. Uh, these also work, but they involve a merger, and the merger will probably have destroyed the disk of the Milky Way, so that's probably not such a good idea. Considering that the Milky Way's disk does exist, of course, still. Um, so, well, how could a heavy galaxy have flown past with the same mass as the Milky Way? So, there's only really one heavy galaxy nearby, which is Andromeda. So, we have to look at that in more detail now to see if this scenario makes any sense. Um, so, um, Andromeda also has like 15 satellite galaxies in a thin plane. Uh, the, it's viewed edge-on from 
from the Earth because the Milky Way happens to be the same plane, which is quite interesting. Um, now, basically, it's quite highly significant, um, and it does suggest that the Milky Way might actually have been responsible for the creation of these objects. Um, <coughs> so, we'll talk more about the orientations in a second. The main thing is that uh, an isotropic distribution is already quite unlikely around the Milky Way. If they're unlikely around Andromeda and uh, around both of them at the same time, it's very unlikely. Also, we can't really see this level of detail around any other galaxies. So, we don't need to worry about that at the moment. Um, so, um, well, let, let's actually have a set. Um, yeah. Um, what I'm going to show now is the orientations of the um, various planes involved. Now, uh, so to define a plane, we define it like a normal vector, which is the angular momentum for like the system. Um, so there's several planes shown here. First of all, the Milky Way's disk plane is like down here, and Andromeda's disk plane is here. Um, now, the actual orbit of Andromeda around the Milky Way is shown by the orange line. So basically, that's an error bar. Um, it, the best way value is here, but uh, it could be here. Love that. Now, um, I'm guessing though that the actual value is going to be here. And what uh, has happened is that um, you know, when you get the galaxy to fly past the Milky Way, um, the, a gas particle which is sort of orbiting around the Milky Way will uh, gain um, angular momentum from Andromeda. And therefore, you will sum the uh, orbital angular momentum plus the initial angular momentum, like because it was in a spinning disk. Um, so basically, you sum a vector pointing this way with a vector pointing this way. We don't know the relative contributions of the two, so you could end up anywhere along the line journey here and here. So obviously, it is possible to end up here, which is actually the normal to the orbital plane of the Milky Way satellite galaxies. Now, that might look like it's, well, anything was possible, but it's not really, because anything on this line, and there's the rest of the sky. Um, so, um, what about Andromeda satellite galaxies? Well, they're in a plane which it was normal is like here. So, and uh, that for Andromeda, you could have started, you, you could have, you could add like the orbital angular momentum with the spin angular momentum of Andromeda's disk, which is here, and end up anywhere between those two. So, it would be possible to end up there. So, um, the fact that the Milky Ways and Andromeda's like planes of satellite galaxies are not aligned. There, here, and here. So there's some gap. This could plausibly be explained by the fact that the disks aren't like spinning in the same direction, um, basically. So um, we have need to see really this in more detail, but it's just an idea that this might be what happened. Um, so what about um, unbound satellite galaxies? Well, um, because some of them, in, if they were creating a flyway, some of them would have been flung out and just not captured. So they end up like on either of these two planes, which looks quite interesting. Um, and uh, the, so it, it, there's some kind of serious anisotropy going on in the local group of galaxies anyway. Um, now, um, yeah, um, the uh, problem with the flyby is that it's not actually possible in neutron gravity. Um, so if you, sim if you integrate the equation of motion back in time, so they, they will actually end up in zero in the Big Bang, but I didn't do that. Um, the main thing is that they always more than two million light years apart, um, and they don't actually exist in the spectrum anyway. So there's no flyby. Um, so what about the internal dynamics of the satellite galaxies? Well, they their mass to light ratios are up here. You ask about the mass to light ratios. So there is some uncertainty, right? So it is one for the sun. You could have five or six for a galaxy, or a bit less than one. But you could really have a hundred. So these galaxies actually also fail to work with neutron gravity. Presumably, these in the standard model have large amounts of dark matter. Um, so that's so possible. Are they all galaxies? Hmm? Yeah, these are galaxies. Which kind of points? So dwarf galaxies. Or all the points? Yeah, these are dwarf spheroidal galaxies. They, these are measured from velocity dispersions rather than rotation. But the light is much the same. Um, it's a measure of the acceleration. Yeah, but that, that, I mean, in the dark matter model, that's correct because you get, yeah. I mean, from uh, cosmological simulation, you get that the smallest object 
they actually yeah. more actually made more dark matter and larger objects. Same thing was so that's 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 correct. Yeah. So is that wrong in the no, I didn't say anything wrong. I'm just saying that it's not right if you don't accept dark matter in these galaxies. But if you do, then it makes sense. Um, so, um, what about uh, tides being a possible explanation for the uh, acceleration discrepancy there? So, tides from the Milky Way actually just um, disrupting the galaxies and causing that. The problem is that uh, at the same, what well, basically is a measure of how effective they are by tides. None of these are that strongly affected. They tend, yeah, they're not that big that they'll be affected by tides very much. Also, there's no correlation with this parameter. So this is not the right idea. Um, basically, the dark matter is actually the right answer in the standard model. Um, so um, let's try it together now uh, in the standard model. Uh, the flyby is impossible. Uh, in any case, like um, if two galaxies fly by, then the dark matter is overlap and friction will cause them to, <coughs> to merge. What is worrying though is that any encounter at all will separate the barrier to the dark matter. This is what happens in the simulations. You get dark matter in a spherical halo that barriers in a disk. So they're already well separated. And the flyby or merge will separate them even more. As a result, the galaxies which form from these debris will be entirely baryonic. Uh, that, that, that happens in the simulations. The result is the satellite galaxies, however, they need dark matter. So obviously, they're not formed by an encounter. They must be formed primordially. Um, and that means they must be distributed isotropically, because that's what the simulation showed. The problem with this is that the reality is actually not isotropic. So the neutral dynamics must have been not the right answer. Um, so um, let's like consider how this works with modified neutral dynamics. Uh, these objects are actually, I'll come to that in a sec, but for, uh, otherwise, the Mod seems to have gotten the predictions like to go up this way and actually more or less worked. With these objects, like first of all, look, the mass are really small, only a few thousand sol stars basically. So if you look at them, there's a clear correlation between, so that one means that it's agreed with Mod. If it's much less, then Mod has provided too little force, which is bad. But that only happens for galaxies which are like. So one means it's really strongly affected by tides, and point one means it's not so much. So you can see the clear sort of correlation, and what this shows is that um, the tides from the Milky Way are probably responsible for these galaxies being discrepant. Um, so basically, the idea is that the high velocities of the stars, high relative velocities, are not because they're sort of orbiting each other tightly, but because they simply have different orbits around the Milky Way and it's got nothing to do with how massive the stars individually are. So um, this is essentially how tides can lead to like you, the objects not being in equilibrium, and therefore violating the actually going to calculate like accelerations of the objects. So um, these are not good to analyze at all for testing theories of gravity because they're not in equilibrium, um, essentially. Um, so it seems that you get a self-consistent picture in Mond. Also, you do actually get a flyby in Mond approximately 100,000 light years um, distance. Um, so it, it does seem to all tie together reasonably well, except for I didn't still mention what happened to the Milky Way, like did it actually sustain like a battery when this happened? So it must have done, right? So we'll see if that is true. Um, so uh, what I was uh, helping to do was to look at um, the, eight, the old stars in our galaxy. Uh, essentially, the important thing is for low mass stars, which you're looking at, the metallic of a star is the same as the gas where it formed from. It doesn't make heavier limits very much. And um, the alpha F E ratio is basically supposed to go like that for a single like burst of star formation. Um, because of what well, you you get a different type of star stuff exploding here, which has more F E essentially. Um, the type one is if you want. Um, so this is what we, what should perhaps have happened, but only if there was a single burst of star formation, there might be multiple bursts. Um, so the data actually looked like this. Um, so basically, I'll, I think something happened at this metallicity. So I'll keep the line there on all the graphs. Um, the main, what happened in this graph is that the alpha FE started rising again. So probably what this means is that there was a um, burst of star formation which led to the value rising. 
Now, what I wasn't able to do with my data set was to prove that, that, that by getting a, getting a splitting in the alpha key values between the, pre, between, the, between the two different generations. However, I think there might be a lecture on this tomorrow by one of my friends showing this. Um, I actually have, so if you want to tell you when that would be. Um, but uh, the important thing is that uh, they... Sorry, try to conclude it. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, so um, that, um, that's interesting. Now, another thing I want to say is the heating, disk heating as it's called. So all the stars will have um, a higher velocity dispersion because they have had longer to sort of scatter by the stars, basically. So in the previous slide, we were saying the Milky Way acquired some young stars from the Andromeda. No, 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 I didn't say that. I said it just formed a lot of stars from the gas that exists in the galaxy. Okay. I haven't said anything much about the interpretation of this, though. Um, so with the disk heating, um, this is simply what happens in a galaxy. Like, well, don't worry about the flyby for the moment. Like, these things sound, should happen anyway. Um, so um, you should have... Um, yeah, all the stars should have a higher velocity dispersion because they had longer to scatter by the stars, and they start with a very low velocity dispersion. Just circle the orbits, basically. No random motions. So, um, if we look at the uh, data, then you get like a, all the stars have a higher velocity dispersion. There's a kind of a drop here, and uh, there's also a drop in the other directions a uh, little bit. So what I think happened is uh, like this. So if you're going this way, you want a metal richer star, which generally is born later, and therefore has a lower velocity dispersion. But um, it, if it formed close to the galactic center, then it will have it will be older than ex you're expecting because the metallicity rises faster there. So for the same metallicity, it's older. Um, so um, there, and also interactions between stars are more common there because it's denser. So velocity dispersion will temporarily be higher than expected. Um, so that might be what happened. Now, um, also we'll look at the data, like, remember that if Andromeda did actually fly past, like, it's pulling on material radially away, but it, it's because of the geometry of the flyby, it won't have affected material in the but it won't have affected the vertical velocities much, because it's both above and below the galaxy at different times. So you expect a strong effect in the direction radially away from the galaxy, but not necessarily the vertical direction. So we'll have a look at that in a sec. Um, so in the radial direction, it does appear to be a sharp rise in the velocity dispersion. Um, in the tangential direction, it doesn't really look like it. Um, and in the vertical direction, it's fine. So like the radial direction does appear to be special, suggesting an external fit up to the galaxy. Um, and uh, basically, um, I'd just like to finish with you saying that um, you can uh, explain galactic dynamics without dark matter. Um, and uh, what I was focusing on is the ancient flyway of Andromeda, which is supposed to happen with one. And it, a lot of different lines of evidence seem to suggest it, especially the satellite galaxies, but also the data suggesting ancient star was in the Milky Way, and the reverse um, velocity dispersion trend, which suggests strong radial mixing of material. Um, so, um, yeah, and that might be what I'm doing for my page. I explain it later, right? Um, so um, uh, basically, uh, we haven't found the dark matter, uh, and we've well, actually ruled out quite a lot of possible dark matter particles. Remember that uh, dark matter is beyond the standard model of particle physics, which is quite well understood by now. Um, but gravity is very poorly understood. So perhaps what's actually going on is that you need quantum gravity to explain galaxies rather than dark matter. And if you don't have the quantum gravity, then then that doesn't make the world classical. Okay. Yeah. Well, you already have some more. Many.